Also, uh, give it one second. Uh, and I have captioning on too, so just FY. <clears throat> Right. We're going to give people just sort of one minute to file in and then we'll get started. <clears throat> Hope everyone is having a good day. All right. In the interest of time, we're going to start right away. And then this is being recorded and will be available on our website. Um, thank you for coming. This is a webinar about specifically the resume and letters of recommendation, part of our broader week dedicated at Berkeley Law to talking about the parts of the application. I'm really excited today, uh, and I'm Kristen Thies Alvarez, Dean of Admissions and Financial Aid at Berkeley, but I'm really excited today because I'm not going to just sit here and talk about letters of recommendation and the resume. I'm joined by three colleagues, friends, and experts um, who I will ask to very quickly just introduce themselves, their role, and their school before we dive in here. So I will start with uh, Dean Kirshner. Great. Thank you, Dean Alvarez. I am David Kirshner, the Associate Dean of Admissions and Financial Aid at University of Southern California's Gould School of Law in Los Angeles. Director Riley. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Sam Riley. I'm the Senior Director of Admissions Programs at the University of Texas School of Law in Austin, Texas. Our representative uh, out of state are here for this one. Um, and finally, uh, Dean Gapison Tortle. Oh, don't forget to unmute yourself. Sorry, right, we got it out of the way early. We're good. 16 months, and I still sometimes do that. I apologize. Um, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Christina Gapison Tortle. I am the Assistant Dean of Admissions and Student Financial Services at University of California, Irvine. Thank you for having me. So brief roadmap, um, I'm gonna share my screen and talk about a couple of slides and then uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and come back to this great group of people and ask them some questions related first to the resume and then to letters of recommendation. We are not gonna be monitoring the chat. We will, however, be looking at Q&A and I'll be looking at Q&A to pull audience questions that may be helpful. Um, and so if you wanna post a question there, you're very welcome to, but if you put something in the chat, we probably will not see it. Uh, so without further ado, let me go ahead and start this. All right, uh, we already know where we are, how about that? Um, this is the big picture. We wanted to cover this uh, before we got started with specifics. And it's just a general uh, introduction to what holistic review means. This is not especially Berkeley specific, although it is a little bit Berkeley specific, but I think in general, all of us in law admissions are looking for people who are gonna come to our law schools and succeed academically, who are gonna thrive in our community, contribute to the profession and be a fit for us. And so we basically approach applications looking for those things. We generally don't have cutoffs. We're not weighting specific aspects. So no points are assigned to how good your resume is or how strong your letters are. That's not sort of how we approach admissions. And instead we sort of think about this pretty balanced approach where about a third looking at standardized tests, a third looking at academic record and a third looking at personal information. So rather than focusing on only one piece, you can see that if you did that and, and sort of dismissed one or another third, you would probably not have a successful outcome, no matter how strong, for example, your LSAT was. Talking about letters of recommendation and resume, know that they fall mostly in the personal information section, but there are some crossover points because you might on your resume help us understand the kinds of obligations that you had outside of the classroom that may have impacted your academic performance. Or we may be very deeply impressed when we read a letter of recommendation that expresses that your GPA, even if it's not at our median, is an exceptionally strong one for your major or program. So even though this is largely in that one third or it's one part of one third, it, it's never disconnected from the rest of your application. Um, and we're always going to read everything in your file, even if your numbers do not sort of match exactly what you've read on our brochures. Um, so don't take any of this part of the application for granted, even though it doesn't tend to loom as large in people's minds as some of the other parts of the application. 
There are basically four big questions that we are thinking about what also that's sort of in the background and most of them are not asked explicitly in the application and that's why law school why now why our law school and why we should pick you as opposed to all of the many other qualified people. Um, and since we're talking about resume and letters of recommendation again it's mostly answering the question of why you. Um, it's possible that your resume might shed some light on to, on why law school, um, and it's possible that your letters of recommendation, if they're school specific, might talk about our school. But usually, we're mostly trying to answer the question: Why should we choose you and not one of the many other qualified candidates? So uh, the resume, as I already stated, is really about both substance and context. We are not going in looking specifically for legal preparation or training. It is not necessary to have worked in a law firm to or be a paralegal to uh, apply to law school and be successful. Uh, we do not have a checklist that we use where we sit there and make sure, you know, did you major in political science? Did you do a pre-law organization? Did you spend a semester in DC? That doesn't exist. And so we will, you know, as likely admit someone who's mostly worked in retail and raised a family as we will admit someone who has been a biochemistry major and has been working um, you know, in a in a STEM field, as we will someone who's an English major who went on to get a PhD in comparative literature and speaks three languages. All three of those people might be interesting and wonderful, and we'd invite them to come to our school. All three of those people might be people that we're not able to admit. And so there's a lot more kind of at stake. I do think it's really important to ask yourself about the resume whether it's solid, by which I mean, could it sort of stand on its own? If you just handed me that, is there enough there that I get kind of a solid positive impression of who you are and what I might be getting in a, in a student? Is it robust? You know, if you pare it down so much that I don't even know what the organization you're referencing does or what you did while there, um, it's probably not going to be helpful. And is it complete? So often I suggest to people that they should reject kind of the idea of a resume like a job application resume and instead think of this like a summary sheet where they're summarizing really everything that they've been doing. Um, if you make choices about omitting, you run the risk of that being something we really would have cared about. Some tips here. Uh, most of these are going to be really self-explanatory and frankly, probably fall under the heading of follow the instructions. Um, they're there for the re a reason. And much of this will be covered there. If we have a preference on font size, it's going to be in the instructions and please respect that. The rest of this, again, is you know fairly obvious, including things I've already discussed. We do care about things, though, that might not be obvious, like perhaps the number of hours you worked or volunteered per month or per week. If you can recall that, it's helpful to know whether this is something you did, you know, one or two times for one or two hours a couple years ago, or whether it's something you've done every single week for three years. Uh, similarly, I like to see progression in roles. So if you started out as a member of an organization on campus or in community, and you became you know, the membership chair and then the co-president, it's nice to see that kind of progress. And if you compress it too much, and I don't see that, that might be something that uh, would have worked in your favor and then we don't learn about. And then I generally recommend to everyone that you think again about this broadly. Um, and so you include things like other skills and interests, other involvement. So don't limit yourself to law school specific things. And if you spend a ton of time playing the piano or volunteering in your church community or helping raise your nieces and nephews and you leave that off, you're probably doing yourself a disservice. A couple of things to avoid, and I think this is actually the last slide I'm going to talk about. Um, this is, again, not a resume for a job, so we don't need an objective. And I'm going to venture to guess that if you did include an objective, it would be to gain admission to law school, which we already know because you're applied. <laughs> um, I, I've seen a lot of, I feel like they're, I feel like I'm getting old and there's like these newfangled resume approaches where like they have a sidebar where they list bulleted like skills and key attributes like a proven leader or something like that. Um, we're not really looking for just a, long, a list of things that don't have any um, 
evidence to support them. You're probably not going to put, you know, chronic absenteeism or something negative as one of your attributes. So it's going to be nice things about yourself and you don't need to include them. Um, similarly, uh, I don't know what's happening in the world that we're getting a lot of resumes that have, you know, a lot of diagonal lines colors and photos embedded in them. But um, basically, you want to keep this as tame and basic as possible. Think about our poor our eyes reading many of these. You actually don't necessarily want to stand out in that process. You just want to be clean, organized, and easy to read. Um, obviously, you need to be completely honest here. And I will say that some, I don't bring that up because we see a lot of problems with this, but when we do see problems with this, they become big problems. Like when you go to apply for the bar and you exaggerated a role or the amount of time you were in it and they see your application and uh, what you report to the bar is different, that can be a problem. So err on the side of caution. Um, and more than anything else, I would say that unless the school tells you you are limited to a single page, you are not limited to a single page. Uh, most people don't have four or five pages worth of stuff that they can include, so it's not usually a problem of volume for us to uh, review the information, but two pages often does the trick, gets us enough sections that are important, relevant with enough information and enough bullets, so we've actually learned more about you that we would like to know. Um, so with that, let me stop the sharing of my screen, I hope. Yes, no. Um, oops. Can you guys see me? All right, here we go. Um, fantastic. So I would love to ask the panelists some questions because we all come from different institutions and have been doing this a long time, probably a frightening number of decades if we added it all up, but we have different takes on this. So I'm going to start with uh, Dean Kirshner, and I'm wondering if you can share some examples of resume mistakes that people make. Sure. So I think what I'll do is um, reiterate uh, a few of the things that Dean Alvarez showed in, in her slide, because a number of those kind of do fall in the category of things that I see quite often. Um, that just don't work on a resume. So one is going back to that objective, right? I mean, it, it all comes down to you have a limited amount of space on your resume um, to convey what you want to convey to us. So putting anything in there that doesn't help advance your cause is taking space away from that which would. Um, uh, so, you know, generally speaking, I think a mistake people run into is is trying to be too fancy on the resume. And, and, and that gets to another one of those points, which is we read so many of these, um, make it easy on us. When I see resumes with columns, like two columns or three columns, which happens more frequently, my eye doesn't know where to go. And you know what you wanna do is use that resume. Think of it almost like a roadmap, right? You're, you're, driving, down, uh, you're driving down the highway and you see exit signs and that helps point you in the correct direction. I think a well done resume helps point us in the right direction towards the experiences you want us to see. Uh, and if you have multiple columns and diagonal lines and squiggly lines and, and other things, it makes it that much harder for us to follow in any particular kind of direction. Um, finally, I think a mistake people make is they forget that we're looking at your resume next to the other pieces of your application, right? It's, it's, it's one package. So if your personal statement um, goes on at length about your desire to work in public interest and give back to the community, and there's not a single item on your resume that shows you've ever given back or done any type of service, um, that's going to raise some concern. So certainly that doesn't mean put things on your resume that aren't there. Just make sure that you realize the resume is part of a cohesive package to your application. That's so helpful. It's something that kind of gets lost a lot. We do not ever pull apart parts of your application and send different parts to different people, nor typically are we only reading one section and disregarding the rest. Well, never are we doing that. Um, and so uh, while it has to be solid and, and 
significant on its own, it's also always in context with the rest of your application. Um, so Christina, speaking of which, you know, context with the rest of the application, but also it's in context with an overall review. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if you could talk about how you use the resume. Do you read it first? Do you read it last? Um, you know, when are you looking at it? And, and or maybe it changes throughout the cycle. But, mm -hmm. but what does that look like for you? Thanks, Kristen. Dina. And we will, I'm sorry, we are all friends and I will, as yes. I have already done, devolve into first names. Yes, Apologies. wonderful. <laughs> um, so for me, I'm actually looking at your application first. And the way that we built our application for admission is it will be the first uh, written document that you are submitting that we see after we go through the whole application. So there's all like the little technical questions. There's things about employment. Um, I should uh, diverge and say that if you do respond yes to character and fitness, that would be the first thing I see, then the resume. If you answer uh, uh, in the negative, like you do not have any character and fitness issues, then the resume is the first thing that I see. And I've already got in my mind from the application what I'm going to see on the resume, but the resume is the precursor to the personal statement. And so you're giving me that broad view and then kind of in a way going narrower and narrower as I read through the personal statement, the um, uh, YUCI statement, and then the optional essay. Um, so I have this roadmap of what you've been doing. And then after I read through all of that, I'm now looking at your CAS report. And sometimes my memory is great. Like the first couple of uh, files that I'm reading uh, on a reading day, I could actually quickly remember some of the things that you've written on your resume. But chances are I've got the two open and I'm looking at your resume, taking a really quick glance and then looking at your grades to see how they were earned. What were you doing with each semester that you were earning your grades in undergrad or if you're pursuing a master's or a doctoral degree? And so I'm looking at that, I'm looking at what you've done and I'm seeing them in, uh, in tandem to each other. Great, thank you so much. Um, and it's probably true that everybody reads a little different or does sort of mix it up, but I think part of what both of you have suggested is that you're looking at resume very early on mm -hmm. and it's setting the stage and sort of piquing your interest and giving you clues about what you might continue to learn about this person. Um, okay. And so while we might return to it multiple times, it's often amongst the very first things that we see. Absolutely. So Dr. Riley, Sam, uh, one of the questions I get a lot from folks, particularly those who are currently undergraduates or very recently graduated, is a, a general expression of anxiety related to the fact that they won't have enough work experience to be a competitive candidate. Um, I'm wondering if you have some specific advice you might give to someone who's maybe a college senior and thinking, you know, I've been spending all my time being a student. Uh, how do I make my resume look impressive for law school? Um, yeah, that's a, uh, a popular question I get a lot as well. And I'm sure uh, our colleagues do as well. Um, so you don't necessarily have to have a lot of work experience. You should have some type of experience. And someone asked this question in the chat about what other sections that we can include on a resume. Um, so you, you, it's a, you're an individual and you're gonna stand out based on your efforts. And so you should try to make a resume. This is your chance to make your resume uh, still professional, but individual to who you are. So you probably wanna list out everything you've done since you graduated from high school any type of leadership you've had, any type of memberships you've had in organizations. Uh, and you can put, you can act, actually make those different headings. If you see that you have a lot of volunteer experience, you can have volunteer experience and then list all of that out. Uh, leadership roles or activities, different things like that as a, a way to stand out as well. Um, I've seen applicants who've listed places they've traveled. Uh, if you've traveled a lot, if you, that shows us how you're able to, you know, your diversity, your diversity of experiences, um, proficiency in different languages. If you can speak multiple languages, languages that's something you can include in your, uh, in your resume. Also, uh, if you've written a thesis or you've written a, a paper of substantial length, you may want to include that as well. Again, this is a, a, a point in the application where you can stand out uh, in a way based on what your efforts have been, uh, again, since you graduated from high school up until this point in your life. I think, yeah, that 
Thank you so much. And it, it kind of dovetails with something that was mentioned earlier, just about there not being a checklist and there isn't kind of a prototypical law applicant. Um, so, you know, you can only be you, you can't manufacture work experience that you don't have, but that work experience is different than experience. And the examples that you gave around travel and language or research are really important. I often tell people like, if you were super nerdy, like express that in your resume, you know, that maybe you did research, maybe you wrote an honors thesis, maybe you, you know, took a really heavy course load and want to highlight some, you know, key courses that you took at the graduate level or something along those lines. Maybe you won a bunch of scholarships, honors and awards. It's going to be the substance that drives it. Um, and to the person's point who asked about specific sections. I have no expectations. In fact, I would invite you to think about the sections in your resume to how to like strategically group things in some ways to your best advantage. So if you don't have a lot of paid work experience, just create a section called experience, right? Where there's one paid job and two volunteer. But if you're someone who has a ton of volunteer experience and much, a great deal of experience that's campus experience, you might actually put community service and a different section that says campus leadership, right? Um, and uh, it just it just depends. I will say I expect to see education at the top. Um, we're evaluating you for, to become and be a student. So that's first. Sometimes people will put within that honors and awards or things that they've done. And other times they want to really highlight those. And so they have a whole section that's scholarships, honors, and awards. Um, there isn't a there isn't a right answer, but I should be able to like scan the headings and get a little bit of a sense of what I'm getting. Somebody who has a research section, somebody who has a you know work section, somebody has a community involvement section. No right answer, but to follow along with David's point, please make it easy on us <laughs> to, to sort of understand how things work together. Um, and I think Dean Gappison is answering this, but but the person who asked about uh, trainings, my answer is yes. I assume that was your answer as well, Dean Gappison. Yeah, I, we want to know what you've been doing since you finished high school. So if what you've been doing is getting trained to be a you know a, a peer advocate or a peer mentor, that should be on your resume. Um, a couple of other uh, questions, sort of related to resume being referred to in the bar application process. Um, I, I wonder if any of you kind of want to chime in. I don't know the extent to which maybe Dean Kirshner you're in, involved or see this, um, you know, what we hand off to the to the registrar and what people are referring to when they send in a bar application. Yeah, so I mean, I think, and, and this is, you know, from my conversations with our registrar who handles the moral character um, issues at the law school, um, I right, so I don't think there's an issue, right? If you're leaving certain things off your resume in particular, right? If you're what's considered a non-traditional student and you've had a pretty extensive working career, right? So I don't view that as hiding anything. I view that as you making choices, making affirmative choices about what is most important to convey to a law school. Primarily my understanding um, is to what the, right, the bar examiners, at least in California, um, are looking for, they're looking for discrepancies in particular on the conduct related questions that some law schools um, may ask on their applications. Not so much that there wasn't something listed on your resume that may have come up during their background check. I don't know if anyone else think that that's what I hear from my registrar as well. It's, it's not getting dinged for like omitting something on your resume. Um, it's when you say that you were at a position as the manager for a year, and in fact, you were the assistant manager for three months, um, where you know the the bar could take issue with that. Likely, they would simply ask for clarification, right? Um, but you know, they they do some interesting things, like where they ask, like basically, if you to list everywhere in California, you everywhere you've ever lived. <laughs> forever since you're 18, which was really weirdly challenging, actually. Um, and so sometimes they do ask for these like long inventories, but generally it's not a gotcha proposition. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. And I think the question was asked and answered about gaps in resume. Um, whoever answered that, whichever one of you, do you mind just sort of addressing it for the group before we move on? I think it would be helpful. What do you do if you have a clear gap um, in a resume? I answered it uh, in the chat and I will just um, say that uh, 
if you volunteer, definitely include that. It may not be work experience that was paid, so you may have to go out of order, but um, that is something that you can put in there and uh, we're happy to see it. Some gaps are uh, expected, I guess, like right after you graduate undergrad, um, a couple of months off uh, the, to sort of decompress that and look for a job um, is something that we sort of anticipate. Um, I like hobbies. I really do or fun things. So if you hike the Appalachian Trail, for example, that could take four to six months. Um, and, you know, maybe I'll glean it from your personal statement because it was something you wrote about, but I would definitely uh, include it in um, hobbies and, and the time frame that you did it. Because I'm, I'm really, like when I look at the resume, yeah, some of it is like work experience, boom, 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 what you've done. But then when you go to volunteer experience or um, uh, extracurricular activities, I'm actually looking for like a time frame of like when you started college and then building that uh, uh, timeline for you. So it's okay if it's out of order because it's different things. No, that's such a good point. I mean, we are looking for real people, um, right? So uh, if you hike the Appalachian Trail, I'm thinking about how many people come to my law school who have sort of like the Pacific Coast Trail or somewhere mm -hmm. in the Andes or did something like that. It's a lot, or you spend a lot of time rock climbing or a lot of time doing something else. We want to meet you and most of us don't have interviews. So this is our only opportunity. Please include things. I will say at my school, and I don't know if anyone else has this uh, for their institution, we have a question on the application that says if there's a gap in your resume of greater than 90 days, please explain. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very short response. I don't need a novel. Right. Um, and honestly, I can tell you completely truthfully, I don't care what the answer is. Right. You could say that you were incarcerated and have a really great explanation and a character and fitness statement. Mm -hmm. But I get a little nervous when I see the gap and you didn't explain it, right. because then it feels like you're hiding something. So mm -hmm. if the question is there, please answer it. Mm -hmm. um, and if you are worried that someone might read into it and the answer is something you'd be happy to share, then I would suggest that you share it. Mm -hmm. um, great. Well, I want to transition to talk about letters of recommendation. That's not to say that you cannot continue to ask in Q&A questions about resume. We should have time at the end. But let's move on just to this second section so that we can get through as much of this as possible. Okay. As Dean Gapson was suggesting, 16, 18 months later, and it's all still a mystery sometimes. <laughs> um, letters of recommendation. So, uh, you know, this is a place where a lot of people get stuck. And again, they're looking for a right answer, <laughs> the magical thing they're supposed to do in letters of recommendation. Um, so it's important to understand what is the purpose. We are looking for a different perspective from your own, right? A different voice than your own that will shed light onto characteristics, skills, aptitude, and potential success in a rigorous academic environment and other qualities such as growth, grit, resilience, uh, passion, etc. cetera. Um, we are always evaluating you to be a student, which is why often we are looking for academic sources. Uh, but we are also evaluating you to be a member of our community and to go on and join our profession. So it's not as if professional letters are not relevant. Similarly, because this question is inevitable, um, if you've been out of school for a really long time, uh, you do not need to be incredibly worried that not having academic letters will somehow immediately just sink your application. The thing to remember is that we want letters that will speak to relevant and transferable skills. Uh, so even if it's not they saw you in a classroom and instead they saw you in a project management situation, talking about your research, your ability to reach consensus, your ability to negotiate, your advocacy skills, those are the kinds of things you might be looking for. Generally speaking, most schools require letters. It's probably not universally true that what that number is or that it's greater than zero, but rule of thumb. Uh, two is often is like sort of most common uh, Four, if we take them through the law school admissions council let service that's going to be the max that can be transmitted electronically uh, you can contact the school if you want to send more than four to ask whether or not they take letters in, a, in an informal process or not they may say no they may say yes um, and i generally recommend two to three either two academic and one from a non-academic source or the reverse, especially if you've been out of school for a while. I actually really like to read the letters that are not just from professors. You don't live your whole life inside of a classroom. So it's, it's helpful to know uh, sort of what skills you bring. 
things to know. Honestly, mostly they're going through LSAC and the Credential Assembly Service that's sort of packaging and collating all of this information for us. Once you sign up and send a CAS report to us, if you send, if letters come in later, they will automatically flow through to us, which is helpful. And uh, please, please, please allow adequate time, not just for your letter writer to write the letter, but also for them to submit it and for LSAC to process it. Um, there are all kinds of moments where that can take longer than you might expect, and you don't want to be waiting to the end of the cycle if you could have been done sooner. In terms of tips, um, we often recommend that people sort of develop what we call an ask packet, ASK, where they're prepared to go into a letter writer's office or to send them an email. Obviously, we're not all together in the same physical space anymore. Um, and to say, are you willing and able to write me a strong letter of recommendation? Um, I'm applying to law school, et cetera, et cetera. And if the answer is yes, and you enthusiastically, that's so great, wonderful, then being able to hand them something that says, fantastic. This is the instructions. This is a copy of my resume. This is a copy of my personal statement. Um, this is sort of like a, a, a cover letter or letter of introduction. And maybe I can suggest that if you could emphasize X, Y, and Z, if you have a copy of your transcripts, if they were a teacher or even an old work product that you have, like a paper with a grade, anything that can help take them from a very bare bones, sort of generic positive endorsement to a really rich, deep um, letter with specific examples would be helpful. Uh, things to avoid, um, and you know, again, if my colleagues disagree or want to elaborate on this list, feel free. Um, family, friends, and relatives, and this is this is a I don't I don't this I feel like this didn't happen a lot like ten years ago, but recently I've read a lot of letters of recommendation from a parent who happens to own a law firm who you absolutely interned for in the summer but I cannot rely on your parents' recommendation of you. They love you. I love my kids. They're gonna say nice things. It's not gonna be helpful to us. Um, and similarly, uh, your next door neighbor who you babysat for, who's a judge, but really remembers you as a 14 year old and, and mostly just knew your parents or something, um, they're gonna say nice things about you too, but they're not gonna say anything that's relevant to our consideration of you. Your babysitting skills are not going to sort of transfer um, and you're gonna raise the question of why didn't you have someone else? So we don't need them to be from you know, an impressive person, we need the letters to be um, impressive in terms of their content. Experience, uh, so the relevance of the experience can a little bit matter. Uh, you know, some years ago, I think a number of us got a letter of recommendation from someone who had been a dog walker for two professors. Um, and it, it was a lovely letter, but it just was not relevant at all to our consideration of them for law school. Um, sometimes two is just great. Please don't wait till the deadline and do not write the letter yourself. And I do think this comes up because people are like, oh, oh, sure. You know, I'm busy. I, I'll write a letter. Can you draft it? And then I'll just add a little something and send it in. Um, that's problematic. I, it, it, to me, that, what that signals, honestly, is that they're not particularly committed to advocating for you and that you should ask someone else. Because if they really wanted to write you a strong letter of recommendation, they'd find the 30 minutes or so that it would take to do so. And if they can't find that, they're probably not the person you most want to sort of endorse you positively. And then, you know, my colleagues have heard me say this before, I have kind of four rules of letters of recommendation. So if you take nothing else away from this, think about this. We care about substance, not signature. If you worked for a congressperson and you never interacted with them, but you're really set on getting a letter of recommendation from them, we are not going to be impressed with their signature at the bottom of the page. You may have wanted to instead choose the person who actually heard you taking constituent phone calls and problem solving. So the office manager or something along those lines. We want anecdotes, not adjectives. So saying, you know, David is a wonderful person. Christina is a, you know, talented colleague and, and, and Sam is a, I don't know, beautiful singer. I have no idea of that. <laughs> sure. Um, uh, 
without an example of where they've seen that and how they sort of compare that in context to others is almost meaningless. I don't know what good, excellent, beautiful means if I don't have any sort of story there. Relevance, not relationship, that goes back to some of the other points. Um, and quality, not quantity. So four letters is not better than one or two letters that are exceptionally good. Sending more to send more is not, is not a, the thing that we're going for. All right, uh, let me. So I've got one for the tips. You what, you've got one for the tips? I have, I have one tip. Okay. That, I haven't seen it that often, but uh, I think it was last cycle I saw um, the applicant had a coworker write their letter of recommendation as opposed to the supervisor. I had never seen that before and it just didn't feel right. They said great things, but I would prefer to have it from the supervisor and not the coworker. How do you all? Yeah, did you want to make a counterpoint? <laughs> the counterpoint I would make is that if it's a coworker, it's somebody that you have collaborated with, um, and they can give examples of possibly like your leadership or your teamwork. Um, you know, in this day and age, it could be challenging to get a letter from a supervisor, um, especially if the company is possibly looking to make cuts, um, you know, and they hear that you're going to law school or wanting to leave, they could be like, all right, let's put, um, you know, Dr. Riley on the chopping block. And so I have um, typically said, I'm okay with a coworker or sometimes a colleague, if you are in a professional organization and maybe have done work for that particular organization. Like the four of us, for example, we uh, volunteer for the Law School Admissions Council and have done work and collaborated on different major projects for them. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, you're probably gonna get different answers from different people and we're all we're all gonna have our little idiosyncrasies too, just so that you know. Um, you can always contact our offices if you have a specific question. I I sort of, I'll, I'll split the difference, which is that I, I think a letter from a, a colleague or a co or, or teammate could be helpful, but it should be, sub, there's a saying in law, like, it should supplement, not supplant. So if you have two really strong academic letters and one from a previous supervisor, because you don't want to tell your current supervisor you're applying to law school, and then you're worried like, oh, well, where are they going to wonder why I don't have someone for my current role? Like adding a fourth that's supplemental that speaks to your ability, your, you know, sort of who you are as a coworker could be incredibly helpful. Um, certainly isn't going to be harmful. But if that's the letter you get and it, we're sort of left going like, well, I, I need more because you only sent that letter. Um, it might be a little bit problematic, if that makes sense. Um, so I, I again, I have some questions and I will go to these questions um, and I'm going to start with with Sam. Uh, so you have to set aside the obvious answer here, Sam, which is every lawyer's favorite answer of it depends. <laughs> How many letters of recommendation do you want to see in an application? And maybe I'll also open this up after you answer to, to both David and Christina to see if they have a different take. Yeah, absolutely. Because in Texas law, it's two, no more, no less. Uh, we don't give a range. Um, I think two is a really good number for us. And uh, it, it's, it sets, you know, the stage, two people. It could usually be two professors or two supervisors or whatever the case may be. But I will add that uh, because some law schools, two to four, there's, you know, there are optional numbers for different schools and David and Christina will share their numbers at their schools. Uh, you can, if, if you're applying to Texas law and you're applying to other law schools, hopefully, I'm sure, and they require four, then you can pick the two that you would like to submit to Texas. And, and there's no reason why you can't even ask more people who, who will say great things about you and be strategic in which ones will go to which school. So if you're applying to an environmental law program in a particular law school and you took an environmental sciences course with this professor, that uh, letter of recommendation will fit perfectly with that law school, but it may not fit with any of the other law schools you're applying to. So you can ask for more and you can be strategic in uh, submitting them to the different law schools that you're applying to. And before David and Christine, you chime in, one thing to note too, because you can send them differently, um, you, sometimes people will get school specific letters, which can be most welcome, but then you also have to be very careful that you send us the correct letter, just to be, be aware. So um, uh, David, do you wanna start? Just yeah. how many, how many, what makes you happy? Sure, so we will accept up to three 
And if you have three strong letters, three strong letters make me happy, um, right? It's, it's one of those things we are giving you the opportunity to submit up to three letters. Um, in a competitive environment, you should want to take advantage of as many opportunities as you have to make the case for yourself as an applicant. So three strong letters um, certainly help, uh, help to do that. Don't forget to unmute yourself. That's going to be great on the recording, me making that face. It's going to probably end up as a meme. Um, at UCI Law, we require two, but we'll take up to three. And I am totally fine with uh, just two. Um, if you are uh, in applying straight out of undergrad, the expectation is there is at least one letter of recommendation from a professor um, or a graduate assistant um, that uh, whose class that you took. But one is enough in terms of that. And I will simply chime in that um, anywhere from two to four is welcome, but three makes me happy. Um, mm -hmm. I just find that like some complementary set of both academic and non-academic sources mm -hmm. usually gives me a sort of fulsome picture of a person. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll stop there. So uh, Christina, this is, you know, real talk here. Um, this is letters of recommendation or a given letter of recommendation or one part of one part of one part of the application mm -hmm. yeah. um and obviously they feel really high stakes which is why we're doing this session at all but how important are they really and are they actually going to make a difference as people agonize over who to ask mm -hmm. um they make a difference and then again they don't make a difference um and yet that's the whole it depends answer right um you worked it in fair enough it was, it exactly was um so there's we're starting from the expectation that all letters are good and that you've asked your recommender are you able to write me a good letter of recommendation and so you know when uh dean alvarez was like um when she said don't write you know don't write the letter for them if they're lollygagging if they're showing any hesitancy move along to the next person okay because if you force the issue you're going to get something that says christina gappison asked me to write this letter of recommendation she was in my class she was okay best sam riley that sucks and we think all of these things as far as like you you showed bad judgment and your recommender showed bad judgment. And so two instances of bad judgment can really not work in your favor. Um, when you reach out to a professor, have that ask packet that uh, Dean Alvarez mentioned, because that is where they're gonna get their anecdotes. If you took a class from, uh, if you took multiple classes from a professor, they can actually show your growth as a student and that actually is preferred versus, oh, they wrote a wonderful personal statement and they have such an amazing story of grit and resilience. Like that's great if you have that type of relationship with your professor, but make sure that you tell them you need a letter that talks about your abilities inside the classroom. Um, and so that's where we they help um, with employee or employer uh, letters of recommendation or coworkers talk have them talk about your contributions to the work if, if you're having that coworker write it because you're nervous about um you know getting fired or let go make sure that it is on that professional level um, and talking about the collaboration the skill the other skills that are going to be uh, beneficial to you as a law student and ultimately a lawyer so leadership project management teamwork not the fact that your kids are in soccer and so you like to throw one down after a long day at work i i sometimes tell people there's a a 85 10 5 rule for letters of recommendation which is 85 percent of them are positive and unhelpful um they say nice things about you but not i'm not they're not adding a lot of value five percent are 
negative, not because they say you're a terrible person, but because they illustrate bad judgment having asked that person. Another example would be, you know, we've all read letters of recommendation where they insert wrong name or mm -hmm. wrong pronoun. And it's clearly just a form letter that they put your info in and didn't actually correct all of them. Um, that's just an error in judgment having asked that person who clearly was not very invested in you. And then 10% are difference makers. Like 10% are, I read the application and I'm like, mm. and then I read a letter of recommendation or a set of letter of recommendations and I'm like, wow, I need to reread this application. Like this person's amazing. You want to get there um, if you can, but it is hard. And so I recognize like you will not be dinged for being part of the 85 either, mm. like the positive, but sort of vague. Um, so uh you know, this is, this is again a question I get asked a lot, um, David, uh, from people who've been out of school for a long time. We've talked about this a little bit, but I'm wondering if you can chime in for someone who's well past, you know, college or grad school days is like, I don't know any of my faculty members, <laughs> they've probably retired. Um, how am I supposed to go about getting letters of recommendation? And is it going to be terrible that I just don't have any from school? It's completely okay, right? So this is one of those things, um, do not worry, do not lose sleep. Um, so the purpose, ultimately what I think the purpose of a letter of recommendation is, it, it's again, it's to help answer the question um, as to whether or not you have the tools capable that make you capable of success in a classroom environment. So the reason you know, we certainly like to see letters from faculty members is because they can attest to that um, quite well. Uh, especially if they've had you recently in the classroom. But there are other people, there are other individuals who can make those same assessments on you, um, you know, because it's not like we're looking um, to a magical set of criteria, right? There are skills that are going to make you a strong law student, regardless of whether you're straight from undergrad or you've been in the working world. Time management, honesty, integrity, uh, morality, uh, work ethic, right? Those are a wide variety of factors um, that many people beyond professors uh, can, can attest to. So the important thing is, right, if it's someone who knows you from a professional environment, it's that you're clear with them as to what the letter um, should reflect. And it should reflect that skill set that's broadly applicable um, to your success in law school. Yeah, that's incredibly helpful. I'll flip it on its head for one second and just be like, also, if you're very early in your college career and you're walking, watching this recording, forcing yourself to get into the habit of showing up in office hours in the first two weeks of class, introducing yourself, making up a question and building a relationship or laying the groundwork for a relationship that could expand as you take that professor's upper division course or do a project with them um, is going to be incredibly important for you and or maintaining those relationships to the extent that you can afterwards if you have formed a close relationship with a faculty member having them you know provide an update or you providing an update to them uh, in part because it's quite difficult to go back and manufacture them for anyone if it's if, if you didn't have those relationships to begin with and because bad news you're going to be getting letters of recommendation for a long time right you'll get them for scholarships you'll get them for clerkships you'll get them for all kinds of other things and then eventually they turn on professional references too so get in the habit of, of um, figuring out how to ask in a way that you feel comfortable and that will set you up for success um, I think this is a question actually for, for you, Sam, specifically, uh, because someone asks about if there's a limit on two letters. Do you want two academic letters or is it better to sort of have a balance between an academic and a non-academic or do you not care? Um, I, I, I would say that I really don't care. I think when you're trying to decide who to choose, we've said this a few times, um, you need to choose the people you think are going to say the best things about you. And when you ask them, when you write a great letter of recommendation, will they do it? So there's something you probably haven't thought about. Either we've mentioned this, that uh, choose bad judgment and choosing who to select for that letter of recommendation. So this isn't an easy process. So you're going to have to really think about this. Um, and it's probably not something you're going to be able to do overnight. But and if you have nightmares about it, that's good. That means you're really thinking about it. And you, you're probably having nightmares about the person you shouldn't pick. And so you, choosing wisely is very important. Um, if you're 
it, it doesn't really matter if you have work experience or internship experience and you had a great relationship with that person and you know they're going to say great things about you, then have them write and they're your supervisor in any capacity, then you should have them write your letter of recommendation and you feel that they would do a really good job at it. Uh, you know, then you should select that person, uh, a faculty member or someone you've taken the class from uh, multiple times. Same thing. If you know that they will say great things about you and your uh, why you've been in their class or there are multiple classes you've taken with them and you participated, they can say a lot of great things about your speaking ability, your intellect, your not just your grades, then you should choose that person. So you should really think about it, pick who you think is going to do the best job, um, and then choose those two to submit. Great. Um, really quickly, we had a question about page limits on LORs. I don't think anyone has any. Am I wrong But my representative sample? I don't think anywhere in our instruction in our instructions do we express that. I rarely see a lot of recommendation longer than something that meanders slightly onto the third page. Um, but I don't know that I would care if it was a little bit longer as long as it was still substantive and persuasive. Most of them are a page to a page and a half if I had to venture a guess. Um, but there's no page limit. So this is actually, I think, a really good question and a timely one. Um, what advice would we, and maybe we can go around and see if someone can start and people can add on, would you have for current undergraduates whose ability to form personal relationships with their faculty members has really been hindered because of the pandemic and the move to fully online learning, probably at least for last year and maybe, you know, continuing on. Um, so, you know, in that scenario, I said, like, show up at office hours. What's the online equivalent of that? And don't say online office hours. But um, <laughs> uh, what what should people do um, in, in COVID world uh, to build these relationships that will set them up for success? Does anybody want to volunteer to jump in? I'll have to resort to the Socratic method. <laughs> All right, I'm going to start with uh, David then. Yeah, I mean, so I think, right, we all certainly have lived through the pandemic, so we understand that it has impacted um, people in a wide variety of ways. Um, you know, my advice would be to the extent that you can is to try to form those personal relationships. I know different schools have different protocol and some faculty still are not comfortable meeting in person in office hours with students. And we certainly understand that. Um, and, and Kristen was correct when she said that, right, Zoom office hours don't replace in-person office hours. Um, you know, I think it's doable, but it requires more work on your part to foster that relationship. It's, it means staying in touch via email, um, seeking feedback when you have questions, potentially on a paper, um, uh, you know, the, it's, so it just is going to require some creativity, um, and it's going to, you know, require, uh, some more work on, on your part. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I'll say this kind of is a reference point. My wife, um, is a faculty member at USC, not at the law school, but a different school at USC. And I've seen, she's been able to foster, um, some great relationships mm -hmm. with, um, with students during the pandemic. Um, a few have asked her, um, to help on research projects, and she's mm -hmm. been willing to do that. So it's all about finding ways um, to, well, not replicate that in-person experience, um, to create a new type of experience. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have anything to add? I think first and foremost, you have to really commit yourself to being a good student, regardless of whether you're in-person or virtual. Like, this is going to be slightly controversial, but there are times where you're going to have to, you know, participate and your camera is going to need to be off. Maybe it's, you know, draining too much, um, you know, uh, 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 power or speed. I know nothing about the internet and how it works, as you can tell by my inability to uh, take myself off Zoom. But sometimes, you know, turning off the camera or if you don't have a camera, you have to just be, you know, that person. Um, that is is nothing but a name, right? It, it, and so that's fine, but you can still use raise your hand. You can still hopefully speak verbally and ask those questions or provide answers. And so while the picture may just always be, you know, the park, 
right? Hopefully, Christina Gappison, she, her, hers, which is not on there right now, um, make some sort of impression. And if you can't make it to office hours, I mean, send out that email that says, you know, Dean Alvarez, I really would like to make it to your office hours, but I cannot do so because my, you know, whatever reason, is there a way we can meet if you have other time? And you may see that the professor may appreciate and be going through similar challenges. They're stuck at home too with other commitments that they have to attend to. And if you're willing to maybe meet at you know 7 a.m. for 15 minutes on the phone even without the camera, you will find that most are willing to do that. Um, the work, you have to do the work. You have to turn it in on time. You cannot make excuses um, in that. And those are the things that are gonna help them realize who you are outside of you know, that face-to-face -face communication. I'll give you just one other tip that took me a long time to learn. Um, mm -hmm. Faculty have our faculty, especially if they're mm -hmm. tenure or tenure track yeah. faculty, both because they teach mm -hmm. and because they do research. And one thing that's true universally about faculty who do research is that they like their own research. They're interested in it. That's why they're researching it. Um, and so if you're ever sort of trying to figure out, you know, the, the easiest gimme is write a separate email to the faculty member after the class that says, hey, I saw your paper on blank. I'm really interested in that topic as well. I'm wondering if you'd like, to, if you could meet me on Zoom, if that's the, what it means to be, um, to talk about how I could get more involved in that area. Um, because it's you, it's that initial like ice breaking moment, um, but that's, a, that's easier than just like, can I come and talk to you? Because, they already know that you're going to talk about something that's about them <laughs> and about their interests, right? And they're enthusiastic and they want to talk to students who share interests with them. So just as a as as one strategy that you can employ, try that one, find the papers that they wrote, look them up, the symposiums they presented, et cetera. As Christina suggested, do the work. Um, all right, we have time for one more question, and I'm going to answer ask this question that I think is also sort of a different side of that coin, which is for someone who asked, I'm a student that's had to work all through college. We get versions of this. I'm a student parent. You know, I'm a student who was a part time student and an evening student. Right. Um, so I didn't really have the time to go to those office hours and build those relationships. And so I have one relationship with a professor. Is that something I need to talk about in my application? You know, is there a problem I have to explain here or is that something I can just move forward with? And uh, how about if we start with you, Dr. Riley? Um, I, I, I would say it's not a problem because I was, when I was in college, I worked as well. I worked, uh, had a work study job and I had another part-time job at a bookstore outside of the campus too. So I fully understand not being able to form those relationships with uh, the, the staff, faculty members. Um, I don't think that's something you need to tell us because I think we're very smart people. We will see that and we will pretty, we will understand that very well, especially, you know, we see two supervisors or multiple supervisors one, and one um, uh, faculty member. And compared, as we mentioned already, comparing it to the resume, which a lot of us look at first to get an idea as to who you are and what you've been doing with your time since you graduated from high school, it's probably not going to be a problem for us to understand that. Anyone else have anything to add to that? Yeah. I, what about if someone, what if this was slightly different scenario and, and maybe David, you can take this one. And they said, I worked all the time to pay for law, to pay for school. And I have no academic letters of recommendation now. Do they need to address that potentially, especially if they're a college senior? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, and Quickly, let me give the reason why, right? So as we're reviewing applications, we are constantly getting questions in our own heads, right? We are wondering why certain things are the way they are, uh, in particular, if there's a gap. And I would certainly consider a gap if you're a college senior with no academic letters. Rather than letting us fill in that gap with our own information, just tell us, tell us the information, right? And, and do it quickly. You can do it via an addenda. Um, most schools will accept addenda, you know, and, and you basically tell us what the piece of information is um, and what you want us to do with that information. So you could very quickly address, you may notice that I don't have an academic letter of recommendation, despite being a current college student. 
this is because, as you can see on my resume, I had to work full time to support myself throughout college and was unable to form those relationships. I won't hold that against you. And then I'll know why there's that apparent gap. That's fantastic advice. It's also a great place to end this because I think with both resumes and letters of recommendation, that's kind of the name of the game, which is you're going to be really up close and personal with it, but you need to step back and think about what you're communicating, how you're communicating it, both visually and in terms of content, and whether or not it's answering questions or raising them. It should be answering questions, right? Why law school? Why now? Why our school? Why you? If it's raising questions, that could be a problem. Christina, you want to give us a last word? Yeah, uh, this is actually uh, related back to resumes. Um, a lot of people are, uh, they did R and R. So they are reapplying this year after having applied previously. Make sure that you take the time to update your resume um, and that you're not applying with last year. So it's those little details that are going to make the difference. Yeah, we didn't talk about reapplicants at all, yeah. but yes, there's always going to be a side but no. Well, thank you so much. It's five o'clock. I really appreciate your time later than that for you, Dr. Riley. So extra thanks for being here. Um, mm -hmm. I hope this was valuable for others. It's going to be available on the website, so it will live for some period of time there and um, as a reference for folks. But again, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I will see all of you soon, I hope. Um, take care.